Yo, if you're new, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. In this video, I want to share with you all how I like to practice blending realistically. So, if you want to learn how I do it, keep on watching. And if you like this video and want to see more like it, make sure you hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell. So without further ado, let's get into it. Alright, so off the bat, I want to make it clear that we're not going to be talking about how to paint realism. We're going to talk about how to blend realistically, which means that you can have a stylized character illustration, but you could also blend it so that it has realistic rendering and textures and so on. So I just want to make that clear off the bat. So while I'll be aiming for realism, everything I'm going over here can be applied to stylized work. Now there is one simple rule for this process, which is do, do not, not use the, the airbrush. airbrush. Okay, now of course it's not an absolute rule, but I'll tell you what, there are a lot of artists, especially ones who are early in their learning of the uh, digital medium, who use the airbrush as sort of a crutch to cover up the fact that they haven't quite mastered how to blend digitally. And a hard edge brush forces you not only to think about your painting in terms of planes, but also how to use the tool effectively. Now what's bound to happen if you use the airbrush ineffectively is your value and color could look muddy and your structures could suffer from that. And that could be due to either inexperience with the medium or due to a lack of structural knowledge. So what you see me doing here is playing around with the airbrush, making some quick value transitions and yeah, it's quick, it's easy, it's very tempting, I get it. But I think you'll appreciate the alternative. Now for my hard brush, what I've done is I've taken one of the default round brushes and edited it, ed edited it, god damn, <laughs> so hard to say. I've taken it and I've made it, um, I've made it more organic by narrowing and slanting the brush tip shape. And then after that, go into shape dynamics, change the minimum diameter to anywhere from 50 to 60%, that way depending on how hard you press onto your tablet, it will change the thickness of your stroke. And then after that, transfer. And go to transfer, and then with the opacity, you just set that to pen pressure, and that way the harder you press, the darker your strokes, the lighter you press, the lighter they are. And all this is done really to make your digital tool feel more like an organic tool. And now that you've got your new organic digital brush, you want to block in some values from left to right or up down, doesn't really matter but you want to block in some values from dark to light and then you want to select that area, delete the rest and focus on blending in the different values you just blocked in. So now in order to blend, you select your brush tool and as long as you have that tool selected, you hold down the Alt key, which is a shortcut by default to the eyedropper tool. And then you tap down on the canvas to select the pigment that you want. And then when you let go, you can brush with that pigment. What you'll notice as I'm blending here is that my strokes are actually visible because I'm using a hard edge brush. So if you want to go for a look that's more on the traditional side, more painterly, then you're probably going to want to use a hard edge brush for that kind of process. Now let's speed up and skip ahead to where I've already laid out my shadow shapes and blocked in my light side and my shadow side. Alright, now here we are at the rendering phase and I've got my shadow side roughly blocked in and my light side roughly blocked in. And it's not totally accurate, but it's accurate enough to move forward. And so, here's how I like to look at it. Let's say you have a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the darkest value you want to use and 10 being the lightest value you want to use. It's good at this point to stick to one half of your value range, so 1 through 5 being the darker half of your value range and 6 through 10 being the lighter half. Now me personally, I like to stick with the darker half first because when I go too bright too soon, my images tend to get a bit too overblown. Now with this reference image, it's a little bit of a challenge because the hair in my reference is a bit overblown, but 
it is what it is you work with what you got but anyway starting with the shadow side the rendering process is actually pretty straightforward we're going to do something very similar to what we did earlier when we took a bunch of value swatches and blended them in together we're going to select a value that is slightly darker than what's already there we're going to lay it into the shadow side where it's appropriate to do so and we're going to slowly blend the edges into the surrounding value that's already there and what you may discover is that more often than not when it comes to building up darker tones in your shadow side you're going to do so most often in areas that are closer to the core shadows and the cast shadows because the rest of the shadow side is usually receiving a decent amount of bounce lighting and so you rinse and repeat until you get your darker tones roughly to the levels that you want them to be in and you want to apply the same method to your bounce lighting so while you're still on the shadow side there are going to be points when you want to select tones that are slightly lighter in order to show the bounce lighting and then you're going to put them into the shadow side and of course you want to render your shadow edges appropriately as well so with the form shadows you want those edges to be a bit softer and with the cast shadows you want them to be a bit harder on the edges now before i get into the light side i want to explain quickly why i'm using a sculpture as reference and not a real person when using a sculpture, there are a number of things that make it easier on you. You don't have to worry about skin tone, skin detail, pores, facial stubbling, anything that'll make it hard for you to see the values. And when it comes to details, especially like the hair, the original sculptor already did the hard work of simplifying those shapes for you. So you don't have to think about how do you simplify sections of hair to create the structure. Now for the light side. Remember when I said earlier that the values that were six through 10 would be the brightest half, right? You wanna select the value that isn't the brightest, but also isn't the least bright. So something like an eight. And then you wanna slowly build up your light values by starting from the brightest planes and moving towards the edges of your form shadows. And as you do this, you wanna try and stay well away from that brightest value of 10. You wanna save that for towards the end when you build up the highlights. And now once you've brought your light side to a point where it's pretty reasonable, you wanna start going back and forth between your light side and your dark side. And you want to sort of finesse everything so that it blends nicely together. And I say finesse intentionally because I feel like this process or this part of it sort of requires not so much a delicate touch, but you wanna be sensitive to what's there so that you don't end up killing the cohesion that you've established. And that should also give you room to enhance what's already there. Speaking of being sensitive to what's already there, here's where I actually bring in the airbrush. With my structure and forms now established, I want to use the airbrush in such a way where I blend and unify the values within the forms, but I don't want to blend the forms with each other. That's how you destroy your structure. And on top of that, what I like to do is increase the size of the brush and create this sort of large atmospheric effect that can then unify the separate forms. But what it could also do is help you get a sort of bloom effect, which you get when you have an intense light bouncing off of a surface to the point where it creates a sort of glow around your object. But again, you don't want the airbrush to overtake your piece. You still want the underlying structure to come through. And depending on how much of a traditional painterly feel you've got underneath, you also don't want the airbrush to overtake that feel. So now that we're entering the last stretch, this is our chance to really punch up those final touches so you want to push your darks a bit push your lights a bit add in those highlights define your structures a bit more your shadow edges and just make everything look like it's finished and then pretty much done so now before we see the end result i'm going to bring it back to the top so we can see it all in one go in five four three two one
And as we approach the end here, I want to thank you all for your comments, questions, and feedback in the last video. Please keep it up because it helps me know what I can do to create better videos for you guys and give you what you want. Speaking of which, if you like high quality fan art, you're going to want to subscribe and stick around to see what's next. So, I'll be seeing you all soon. Until next time, peace out.